السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين الحمد لله حمد كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيك ما يحب ربنا ويرضى وصلى الله على النبي محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله Good morning to everybody um, Hopefully you got some sleep I'm Ready to start your day Alhamdulillah And I can't think of a better way to start your day Than with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So I just want to take some, some time to go over the khutbah As I said before Friday nights I will just continue with the Ramadan series And then Saturday morning Inshallah ta'ala I'll go over the khutbah I'll do the khutbah recap Saturday morning Inshallah ta'ala So that way we don't We don't get out of whack with the schedule, all right? So, alhamdulillah, I don't know how many of you had an opportunity to listen to the khutbah yesterday or attend the khutbah yesterday. Uh, but yesterday I was talking about, um, you know, the exchange. The exchange with giving up something from yourself personally, personal sacrifice, in exchange for greatness personal sacrifice in exchange for greatness and i begin the khutbah by saying that you know embarking on a journey to a higher calling in life requires sacrifice you know we always hear non-muslims talk about um new year's resolutions you know trying to do something new in life embarking on a new journey you know trying to get to the better version of themselves And all of these phrases, but what people don't realize is that in order for you to get to the best version of yourself, you have to make a sacrifice. Greatness it always lies on the other end of sacrifice. You don't get to greatness without sacrifice. That's a fact. You don't get to greatness without sacrifice. And so while we always make these great New Year's resolutions and I'm about to do this and I'm about to be on this type of time and I'm in this type of era and all of these phrases, fancy phrases that we come up with. We rarely talk about the sacrifices that we are about to make in order to get there. We rarely talk about the sacrifices that we are willing to make to get to that point. We just talk about getting to the point. So it's almost like wishful thinking. It almost becomes like wishful thinking, you know, I'm going to do this or I'm going to become this and I'm on this type of time and, you know, I'm trying to get to this type of place. And it's just wishful thinking because we never talk about what sacrifices we are about to make in order to get there. All right. And then I said that, you know, parting ways with who you are for who you will become is the greatest form of sacrifice. This is what is called self-sacrifice self-sacrifice and i mentioned a, a statement from uh one of the scholars of the past muhammad ibn munkadir where he said jahadtu nafsi jahadtu nafsi sana i struggled with myself i waged war against my soul there was a battle a fight for my soul for 40 years until my soul conformed To the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another narration, another scholar, he said, I struggled with myself for 40 years so that I could relax for the next 40 years. I struggled with myself for 40 years so that I could relax for 40 years. Because if you put in 40 years of work, discipline in your soul, You put in 40 years of work of discipline in your soul, then you're going to reap the fruits of that labor for the next 40 years. And that is that you don't have to worry about your soul deviating from the script. You don't have to worry about your soul deviating from the script because you've disciplined your soul to such a degree that, you know, you can let up off of it a little bit. You don't have to be so intense with yourself because you have put the work in. To discipline the soul. And then I use an example of this 
of Prophet Ibrahim and, and there's, there's a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Ibrahim all throughout the Quran and if you notice almost every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Prophet Ibrahim salam, he's mentioning him in some form of struggle struggle with his family struggle with his father struggle with his people struggle with you know even leaving his wife and his ch and his child it was test after test after test if there's anyone who was battle tested it was prophet ibrahim alayhi salam look at every single time even down to when he was a younger man when he was thrown into a fire and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the fire be cool and that seems like that was a constant theme throughout his life because the fire was always cool for him. The fire was always cool. He was always in some type of fire, always in some type of trial or tribulation, but it was always cool enough for him to come out of it on the other side greater than he came in. You follow me? He always came out of it on the other end greater than how he came in. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُونِي بَرَدًا وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ O fire, be cool and a place of tranquility, a place of peace for Ibrahim. It seems like that was ubiquitous. That was all throughout his trials. The fire was always cool for him. And that's, that's the favor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him. The fire was always cool for him. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes whatever tests, trials, or tribulations that we experience, you know, make them, you know, cool for us. Meaning, make it a benefit for us that we come out of those trials and tribulations on the other end a better person. But this seems to be like this was a common theme with Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Every fire he was in, every trial and tribulation he experienced, he always survived and came out on the other end a better person. Not so much for many of us. We go through trial and tribulation and sometimes we come out on the other end worse because we don't do well. We don't do well with the test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of us just don't do well. When Allah tests us, we crumble. When Allah tests us, we complain. When Allah tests us, we run for the easiest way out, which on the other end, we come to realize that it probably wasn't the best decision. It probably wasn't the best decision. Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Nakir, hayak Allah Yeah, you know what I mean? It's not always, you know We don't always make the best decisions In the heat of our trials and tribulations And we have to do better with that <coughs> So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said That when Prophet Ibrahim walked away from his family Walked away from his father Walked away from his tribe, his, his village Because their insistence upon shirk Allah said, we gave him Ishaq and Ya'qub. وَكُلَّنْ جَعَلْنَا نَبِيًا And we made both of them a prophet. But there had to be a sacrifice. He had to walk away. He had to walk away. And in walking away, he achieved the greatness. And that was a son and a grandson, who both of, both of whom were going to be prophets. SubhanAllah. And it just gives light to the statement of the Prophet ﷺ where he said, Man taraka shay'in lillah awwadahu allahu khayru min That whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah, Allah will replace it with what is better. Whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah, Allah will replace it with what is better. But you have to leave it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't leave it because you don't have access to it. You can't leave it because you just don't want it anymore. You have to leave it purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Leave it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Awwadahu Allahu khayru min and Allah will replace it with what is better. See, we leave things, but we don't necessarily leave it for the sake of Allah. We leave things, but we don't necessarily leave it. We don't want it anymore. We ain't, you know, we ain't on that type of time no more. You know, we just on something different now. Uh, you know, I just don't want it anymore. That's not leaving it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Leaving it for the sake of God. Because I'm seeking his pleasure, not my own pleasure. You understand? You're putting God before yourself. You're putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before you. And that's meritorious in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
But just leaving something because you just don't, you're not interested in anything. There's no reward in that. Leaving it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that involves a conscious decision, a conscious choice to put God's pleasure over your own personal pleasure. You put Allah's pleasure over your own personal pleasure. And that is meritorious. That's virtuous. And so Ibrahim, alayhi salam, once he realized that his, his family, his village, his people were insistent upon shirk, he walked away from them. How many of us can do that? We got family members, friends that we cannot walk away from for whatever reason. You can't walk away from. And they are the ones that become the obstacle hindering you from the best version of yourself. That's a fact. Some of us right now, some of you listening right now, you cannot get to the better version of yourself because you cannot walk away from the people that are in your inner circle that are not good for you. And so therefore, you, you get what you got. You're the same person year after year go by and you, you're still stagnated because the consequences of complacency is stagnation. A lack of growth. The consequences of complacency. You're complicit in your own lack of growth and development. You are complicit in your own lack of growth and development. Even if it is your spouse, there is nobody that should be off limits when it comes to you choosing between your getting to the best version of yourself and pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There should be no one who is off limits. No one who is off limits. Not, not your child. Not your child. Not your spouse. Not your mother. Not your father. No one. There should be no one that is off limits. You refuse to let anyone hinder you from getting to the best version of yourself. You choose the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over your own pleasure or the pleasures of those that are around you. And I get it. You know, some people just not there. It almost reminds me of the hadith of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. You remember when Sa'ad, when Sa'ad took shahada, and his mother was a disbeliever. And his mother said, Wallahi, I'm not going to eat or drink anything until you denounce your faith. She said, and if I die, then you will be accused of abusing your own mother. Your own tribe will disown you. She put him in a very tough situation, man. She put him in a very tough situation. She said, I'm not going to eat or drink. Until you denounce your faith. And if you don't denounce your faith and I die, then your tribe, your people will, they will accuse you of abusing your mother, of killing your mother. And you will have to live with that. And what does Saad say to his mother? Because here again, nobody is off limits. Nobody is going to make me compromise. Saad said to his mother, Ya Ummi, inni wallahi uhibbuk. He said, oh my mother, I love you. I love you, but you will run out of lives. He said, if you, if, if, if every soul and if you had a hundred souls and every soul was to depart from your body one by one, you would run out of souls before I denounce my faith. You understand? You would run out of souls before I denounce my faith. You might as well go ahead and eat and drink because you're wasting your time with this one. He said, if you had a hundred souls and each soul was to depart from your body one by one, you would run out of souls before I would denounce my faith. You think I'm going to choose you over God? You got to be kidding me. No way. No way. And some people put you in that position, whether it's a boyfriend, whether it's a girlfriend, for those of you in haram relationships, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the strength to walk away from it. For those of you that are in a haram relationship right now, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the strength
to walk away from it. Whether that walking away from it is you just going ahead and getting married or that walking away from it means that you just leave the person completely. But you walk away from the haram relationship because the person is causing you to compromise. You will never get to the best version of yourself committing one of the greatest sins in Islam, which is fornication or adultery. You will never get to the best version of yourself. Let me say that again. You will never get to the best version of yourself. So as long as you are tangled, entangled in a haram relationship, you'll never get there. That now becomes your obstacle. You'll never get to the best version of yourself. You will never get to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entangled in a haram relationship. Not going to happen. And what you don't realize is that the very thing that you are afraid of, which is leaving this person or walking away from this situation, the very thing that you are afraid of is the very thing that is going to liberate you and free you and allow you to get to the best version of yourself. Here again, you are complicit in your own lack of self-growth and development. There is no girlfriend or boyfriend in Islam. You're right, but people that doesn't mean people don't do it. There's no racism in Islam either. That doesn't mean that people, Muslims, are not racist. What you're mixing is apples and oranges. <laughs> Just because something is haram doesn't mean that people don't do it. People do it all the time. People do it all the time. <laughs> As they say, fortune favors the bold. Fortune favors the bold that if you are going to embark on, you know, a virtuous path, then that requires you to be bold enough to take the first step, to take the first step. And some of us, we talk a good game, but we really not. We really not about that life. We talk a good one, but we really not that we really not that person. Yeah. And so uh, another example that I mentioned was the example of Prophet Yusuf, alayhi salam. Prophet Yusuf, here again, went through a lot of trials and tribulations. He was abducted from his family. He was literally abducted from his family, sold into slavery, betrayed by his brothers. Zulaikha tried to seduce him. She lied on him, put him in prison. He was put in prison. You understand like there was so much he went through as a result of what his brothers did to him as a result of what his brothers did to him because that's another obstacle for many of us we always sit back and we do nothing because we blame somebody else for our lack of growth and where we are in life i wouldn't be here if this person didn't do this or if this person didn't do that or i would be a good better person if my ex-husband didn't divorce me or didn't treat me like crap I'm right now recovering and healing because of stuff that he did to me or she did to me. Or if this woman didn't do that to me, then I wouldn't be this. We're blaming our complacency, our stagnation on somebody else. Meanwhile, it should have been the fuel that took you to the next level. You take your pain and you turn that pain into progress. You take pain and you turn it into progress. People do it all the time. People do it all the time. Use your pain to project you. To move you forward in life. People do it all the time. Learning how to filter that pain and use it for your own good. They are responsible for what they did to you, but you are responsible for healing and moving forward. That's your job. That's your responsibility. 
Yusuf didn't linger in prison like, oh my God, she lied on me. She tried to seduce me. It wasn't my fault. And I wouldn't be in this situation if my brothers didn't just throw me into a well and sell me into slavery. Oh God, why are you doing this to me? I didn't deserve this. And wow, 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 woe is me licking your wounds. No. He didn't use the situation to keep him where he was. And this is why on the end of that, he became a king. All of what was done to him propelled him to become a king in the end. Which is why he didn't feel the need to do to his brothers what they did to him. When he was in a position to do to them what he could have done to them, he chose not to. That's king behavior. That's king behavior. Because once you crack the code and you realize that all of what you did to me made me a better person, there's no need for me to do anything to you. My success, my success and my greatness at this point is your greatest punishment. My success is your greatest punishment. Because you counted me out. They didn't even know Yusuf was still alive. They didn't even know Yusuf survived and still was still alive. They said, Ainna ka la anta Yusuf? They said, are you Yusuf? You understand? They didn't even know. They did whatever they did to him and moved on with their life. Never to think about him ever again. They never even gave Yusuf a second thought. When they finally found out it was Yusuf, they said, Ainnaka la anta Yusuf. Are you Yusuf? Never even gave it a second thought. And throughout all of what they did to him, Yusuf still managed to come out on top. And as a result, his success became their greatest punishment. I don't have to punish you. Looking at me and where I sit on this throne with this crown as a result of the pain that you cause me is your greatest punishment. I don't have to do anything to you. You understand? I don't have to do anything to you. You did everything in your power to destroy me and I still came out on top. My success is your greatest punishment. You have to look at me, and every time you look at me, I am a reminder to you that all you did to stop me, all you did to destroy me was in vain. And you have to live with that. I would hate to be you. I would hate to be you. I have to wake up every night knowing that, wake up every day knowing that all of what you did, despite all of what you did, this person still managed to become a king. You understand him? I would hate to be you. SubhanAllah on the email. That's facts. Some people, you don't have to punish them for what they did to you. Your success is punishment enough. You don't have to punish them. Your husband divorced you, you know, unprovoked, unwarranted, just discarded you like you were nothing. And then later on in your life, you found happiness. Later on, you found happiness in yourself. And then you attracted somebody because they saw the happiness you had created in your life and they wanted to be a part of it. And then that person that discarded you looks up one day and sees you happy living your best life. And they have to live with that. Your success is their greatest punishment. You don't have to do anything to them. They scrolling through your Instagram page right now, gritting on you, <laughs> hating the fact that you're posting all these pictures and you, you your life is happy, more happier than it was when they when you were with them, and they biting off their fingertips, <laughs> as Allah says to the disbelievers, fi die, perish in your rage, <laughs> perish in your rage. Subhanallah. You don't have to do anything. Live your best life.
your success, the fact that you made it through on the other end and you are successful in life in whatever that whatever realm of success you in, or you are enjoying that is punishment enough you don't have to punish them and so this is what is known as an evolutionary process of the self that you going through you're evolving you're going through these trials tribulations in life only to make it to the best version of yourself. So self-sacrifice comes before greatness. Self-sacrifice comes before greatness. And so this is what fasting in Ramadan is all about. Fasting in Ramadan is a self-sacrifice. Fasting in Ramadan is a form of self-sacrifice. You are giving up your food, your drink, sexual intimacy, you know, some of the bad behaviors that you were so accustomed to doing, but now you got to check those behaviors even in Ramadan. That is a self-sacrifice. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you as well. Alhamdulillah. That is a form of self-sacrifice. And why are you giving this up? Why are you sacrificing so you can get to the better version of yourself? Understand what fasting is about. Fasting is about self-sacrifice. There's a glass of water. There's food in your refrigerator. There's food all over your house. But you won't touch any of it. Because you're putting yourself on the slaughtering block. You are sacrificing your soul. Sacrificing your desires. It's like when you lay an animal down, you put the knife to the animal's neck, you say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and you slit the animal's throat, sacrificing the animal. That's exactly what you're doing to your desires in Ramadan. You're putting the knife to the neck of your desires and you are slaughtering your desires so you can get to the best version of yourself. Greatness comes as a result of sacrifice. Two verses in the Quran that point to that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will never attain righteousness until you spend from what you love. And although the ayah is in the context of giving sadaqah, but also giving from what you love means giving up the things that you love. You will never attain righteousness until you learn how to give up the things that you care most about. And what do we care most about? We care a lot about food. We care a lot about what we drink. And we care a lot about sexual intimacy. We are literally giving up, spending from what we love to attain righteousness. That's exactly what Ramadan is. It's a fair exchange. You're giving up food, drink, sexual intimacy, bad behavior, or behaviors that you know are very common in our lives and very easy for us to go to. Those easy go-to behaviors like profanity, like jealousy, like envy, like anger. We're, we're, we're giving up those things in exchange for righteousness. You will never attain righteousness until you spin from that which you love. You give up what you love and in exchange you get righteousness. That's a fact. There's another ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when he's talking about slaughtering. Pay attention to this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's talking about slaughtering. He says, He said that when you slaughter your animal, the meat and the blood does not reach Allah. You ever slaughtered an animal? Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. The blood and the meat of the animal doesn't go to Allah. The blood and the meat of the animal that you slaughtered does not go to Allah. Allah doesn't, that doesn't benefit Allah. But the taqwa that is in your heart, the righteousness that's in your heart, that is what reaches Allah. So the sacrifice that you make of these physical things, these physical elements that you're giving up, Allah doesn't care about that. What he cares about is the righteousness that you are aiming for by doing it. The righteousness that you are aiming for 
by doing it. You guys understand? This is a sacrifice. Fasting in the month of Ramadan is a sacrifice. You're giving something up in exchange for something else. Which means that if you are fasting, but you're only fasting, looking at fasting from a superficial standpoint and that you're not drinking, you're not eating anything throughout the day, but you're not aiming for righteousness, then your fasting has no merit. Your fasting has no merit. The Prophet Wasallam said that Arupa saw him that perhaps the fasting person only gets from his fast thirst and hunger. Because you're not aiming for the right thing. He said perhaps the fasting person only gets from his fast thirst and hunger. Why? Because you're not aiming for anything greater. You're only looking at the fast from a very superficial standpoint. I didn't eat and drink today. Oh, I'm hungry. I'm fasting. That's, that's the greatest. That's the only thing that you're aiming for from the fast. Is to go all the way to the end of the day and break your fast and say, I fasted. I, didn't, I went through the whole day without eating and drinking. That's it. So the only thing that you got from your fast was thirst and hunger. That's it. And then the last point is that uh, I mentioned the um, the consequences of complacency is a lack of growth and personal growth and development. If you remain the same, if nothing changes, then you remain the same. If you change nothing, then nothing will change. Take that with you. If you change nothing about you, then nothing about you will change. That's easy math. If you change nothing about you, then nothing will change. And the consequences of complacency is stagnation. You're ready to sacrifice for a wife? I mean, you, you're ready to give up some things about yourself to welcome somebody into your life? That's a sacrifice. A lot of people talk a good one when it comes to marriage. And marriage is definitely, if you want to have a happy marriage, then yes, sacrifice is necessary. That concept applies to marriage as well. If you want to have a healthy, happy marriage, then it requires sacrifice. If you change nothing, then nothing will change. If you change, for those of you who are single right now, if you change nothing about yourself, then nothing about your relationships will change. You will continue to invite people into your life and have the same exact experience over and over and over again because you didn't change anything. You wonder why you keep having the same marital experiences over and over and over again with different people, but the same experience, because if you change nothing, then nothing will change. What about you changed from the last relationship to this relationship? What about you changed? In that window of time when you there was no one in your life, what changes did you make to your life to bring about a new experience for the next person that comes into your life? But we keep inviting people into our lives, giving them the same horrible experience over and over again. Because if you change nothing, nothing will change. If you change nothing, then nothing will change. You will continue to have the same experiences over and over and over again. Blaming everybody else. For why your situation hasn't changed or why you continue to have the same experience over and over again. When in fact, you are your own worst enemy. You are your own worst enemy. So the last point is the proof that I brought from the Quran about complacency. Meaning if you change the, the consequences of complacency is a stagnation. And I use the 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 passage in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises uh, the promised land 
right? Ardu Muqaddasa um, promises Palestine to the Jews, to Bani Israel during the time of Musa. And however, in order to retrieve this land, they had to fight. The land was being occupied by what Allah, who Allah calls a Jabarin, the oppressors at that time, right? They wanted to, um, Musa told them, in order for you to get this land, Allah has promised you this land, but in order for you to get it, you got to go in there and you got to fight. And I want you to pay attention to this because I'm using this in a metaphorical term. I'm using this metaphorically. Although this is a real incident, I'm going to pull from this incident how concept, how we can use it in other aspects of our lives. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised them Palestine. You can have this land. However, in order for you to get it, you got to go fight for it. You got to go fight. And Bani Israel told Musa, we're not going to go in there and fight as long as those people are in there. You and your Lord go in there and fight. We'll wait right here. We're going to wait right here. You and your Lord go fight. We'll wait here. But we're not going in there and fight. And so as a result, that land was made haram for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَ فَإِنَّهَا مُحَرَّمَةٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةٌ For the next 40 years, the land that I promised you, now I'm denying you it. Because you didn't go in there and fight. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. So you don't get it. And that concept applies to all aspects of our lives. You want the best version of yourself? Go in there and get it. Fight for it. You want a better version of yourself? Go in there and fight for it. Fight your soul. Fight your desires. Jahid nafsak. Wa jahidu fillahi haqqad jihadi. As Allah says in the Quran, and fight and struggle in the cause of Allah haqqa jihadi with the due right that is deserving, that it deserves. Fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the level of energy that it deserves. You want the best version of yourself? Get in there and fight for it. You want a better marriage? Get in there, fight for it. You want a better relationship with your children? Get in there and fight for it. You want to do better in terms of your financial situation? Get in there and fight for it. I can, I can go on and on and on and on and on. You want a better relationship with your parents? Get in there and fight for it. Take the concept and apply it to any single aspect of your life. And it applies. That's the beauty of the Quran. These are timeless concepts. They're not restricted to time or place or circumstance, situation. These are universal concepts that are timeless. Universal concepts that are timeless. And that's how you know the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from God and none other. Because human beings don't have that level of forethought. We don't have that level of forethought. Impossible. Human beings don't have that level of forethought where you can put forth a concept and that concept can be applicable to, you know, can be multifaceted and applicable to many different avenues in life. Human beings, we don't have that level of forethought. But, and if you don't fight for it, then it will be haram for you. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not give it to you. So just like they didn't want to go in and fight for Palestine, and as a result of that, um, the Palestine was made haram for them. Likewise, if you don't go in and fight to get to the best version of yourself, then you will be denied the best version of yourself. You will be denied. And so that was the khutbah yesterday. And of course, you know, I, I, I oftentimes drift and go off on a tangent. And that is because of you know, who's in front of me as I'm sitting down and I'm giving the khutbah and I'm looking at all these young guys in front of me 
Uh, I've been to, you know, many masajid and, you know, d throughout the year delivering the Jumu'ah khutbah. And I don't see some of these young guys that are there that I see during Jumu'ah. So I seize the opportunity, uh, excuse me, during Ramadan. So I seize the opportunity when I get on the minbar and I look out into the crowd and I see all these young guys that I never see at the masjid. Oh, I'm, I'm going to take the opportunity. I'm going to give you something to walk away from. I'm going to give you something to walk away with. So sometimes I'll drift and I'll go off on a tangent about, you know, and depending on where I am and who's in front of me. So while you guys are listening to the khutbah, you might figure out, oh, why is he deviating from the script? The script seems like it was, you know, it was appealing. But I, you're listening. I'm looking in front of me and seeing who's in front of me. And I have to address the young people that is in front of me. Because they're not going to hear a message like this. They're not going to hear this. They're going to walk out of Jumu'ah and they're not coming back to the masjid probably until the next Jumu'ah. They're not coming back to the masjid and probably into the next Jumu'ah. Evidenced by the fact that when I came back from Maghrib, 80% of the people that were there for Jumu'ah never came back to the masjid. Yeah. I'm actually on my way to Philadelphia now to go to a meeting about how we can help solve this crisis in Philadelphia, man. There's a genocide going on in Palestine and there are homicides going on in the city of Philadelphia. It's just, it's ridiculous, man. Just murder, murder, murder. And the Prophet Wasallam prophesied that the time would come when there would just be murder, senseless. The person who was murdered won't know what reason he was murdered. And the person who did the murdering will not even know why he did it. You ask these, get these young guys into a room and you interrogate them and you ask them why you do it. The reasons are so frivolous and senseless. They don't even know why they're doing it. They're in pain. The origin of a lot of their behavior is emotion, raw emotion. I'm sure in D.C., I'm sure in, in Baltimore, in, in all, all major cities, man, it's, it's really sad. But the fuel behind much of this behavior is pain. They're in pain. They are in pain, man. And they don't even realize it. They are in pain. Come to Philly, get a cut. <laughs> uh, inshallah. I haven't been to a barbershop in... Man, I can't even remember. Yeah, man, it's, it's horrible, man. It's horrible. I'm on my way to Philly right now to a meeting. Oh, I, I just... I don't even know where to start, to be honest with you. Um, I, I don't even know where to start, to be honest with you, man. It's just really sad. How do you get these young men to realize that all of what they're doing is fueled by pain from something that stems from their childhood? Yeah, of course, there's a way to reach them, but you got to block out all the distractions. In many instances, the best thing for them in many instances is prison. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say that, but that seems to be where you can remove a lot of the distractions. There, there are way too many distractions because while you're sitting there talking to them, they're absorbing what you're saying, but then they leave out of your presence and go back to their reality. They go back to their reality, which is what I'm saying about people, giving people shahada and then just letting them walk out of the masjid, man. Because you give them shahada, once they walk out of the masjid doors, there's a strong possibility they're not coming back. It's too many distractions. It's even worse in the Philly jails because the a lot of times the um, the pastors and the, you know preachers and the um, religious people that go up there. Um, number one, either they going up on a voluntary basis. 
and not being there's no you know there's no incentive for them and then number two you know you have a lot of the you know extremists that go up to the prisons because they feel like you know inmates are the the easy target of the population and they go up there with ulterior motives to get them to join their culture their their cult they join their you know religious gangs or whatever the case may be there's no teaching that is going on in the prison system that just genuinely wants to help them become better people better citizens in society we're just giving them religion <laughs> you know just raw religion <laughs> you understand you, you got to infuse religious teachings with being human and living in society and there is no greater message for that other than religion of islam but it's all it all depends on the teacher the preacher it all depends on the da'i the person that is giving them dawah you sending people up to the prisons and sending people up to the county jails to you know to teach them islam and you know and they're 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 just giving them you know religious teachings that only fuels you know the street mentality that they already have you're just giving them the ammunition that they need to justify much of the ratchet behavior that they are already accustomed to here again not transformative we have to teach people how to give dawah before we send them to the prisons and the county jails or whatever the case may be there has to be a system there has to be a system just anybody go and fill out an application to become a chaplain and then off you go going up there giving dawah and you don't know the first thing about where to start with this particular population. This particular population has special needs. Many of them can't read. Many of them can't write. Many of them are illiterate. You understand? This ain't just going up there, opening up a book and let me teach you about Islam. You understand? Like, but this is the problem. This is the problem. <laughs> you going up to the prison to try to teach these guys Islam, I'm going to give them dawah and call them the tohi. They can't even read and write. They're illiterate. Many of them had IEPs in school. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> you you got to understand. Ah, man, don't get me to stop. Man, listen. La ilaha illallah. Many of the guys that are in prison, that are in the county jails, are the same kids in school had IEPs. Many of them cannot read. Many of them cannot write. Many of them cannot comprehend. You understand? So you sending somebody up to the prison to go give them dawah that doesn't understand the population that they're dealing with. They are so lost. And then we go up there and we feed them this narrative about Islam and it only gives them the ammunition to continue justifying the behavior that they're already accustomed to. So we're contributing to the problem, not solving the problem. Because here again, we operate as individuals. No one wants, there's no protocol. There's no system in place. It's not like the masjid is having classes or teaching a course on how to give dawah. How to give dawah. Al kafia. That there is a system. And then you're learning that from the masajid, you get your certificate, you get, you know, tested, you get signed off. And then we send you up to the prison now to go because you have been qualified. You have been taught, you've been educated. But there's, there's no system in place. Everybody just doing them. Everybody just doing them and not even understanding that particular demographic or that particular, um, population of of our community but that's 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 a starting point and we have to we have to make sure that you know people are educated if you're going to give dawah you got to be educated you can't just 
read a couple of books and sit in a few classes and think that automatically you a daddy. Being a daddy, number one, is has a lot to do with you being, you know, um, you having emotional intelligence, you knowing how to read people and understand where people are coming from. Being a daddy means that you have to be a good listener. You have to be able to listen to what the person is not saying. Because while these guys are talking, you're listening, but you're listening for what they are not saying. Because as an inmate or as a person from the street, you're always got a, a block up. You always got a mask on. So you got to you got to get around the mask and listen to what they're not saying. And all of this is stuff that you can't be taught just reading a book on Tawheed. You're not going to be taught that. Somebody has to teach you that. Somebody has to teach you that. And I got to get ready to go, inshallah ta'ala. You guys have been great. I do appreciate your time this morning. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Uh, please continue to donate. I don't know if you guys saw the article that um, the newspaper in Newark, Delaware wrote about Rova Islamic Center of Delaware. I shared the article on my Facebook page. Alhamdulillah. Um, so, I mean, you know, we're doing some good things in Delaware. We're getting some recognition. Uh, but here again, we still need your help and we still need your support. So go to our cash app, go to our um, PayPal and please make a donation. We are headed towards the last 10 nights of Ramadan coming up next Friday, inshallah ta'ala. And we want to kick into second gear. We want to kick into third gear. We want to turn it up a little bit more so that we can make preparation to um, reach the last 10 nights of Ramadan while we are at 80, 90 percent, inshallah ta'ala. So please go to our cash app, cash app sign, Roba Islamic Center, or you can use Zelle, which is the mess or Zelle or Apple Pay, which is the message's phone number 302-766-5389. That's 302 766 5389. Or you can use PayPal, which is our um that's just email um Rova Islamic Center of Delaware at gmail.com. What is the goal for the end of Ramadan? I don't the goal in terms of what? Finances? Not sure. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumallah khairan. Please keep me in your dua. Um, if you don't have it to um, um, to donate, then alhamdulillah just make dua for us. I mean, we don't necessarily have a financial goal other than the goal that we need, that we set for um, the building, which the building fund is $180,000. That's the building fund. That's That's the only fund that we have. Uh, we will begin starting next week collecting uh, money for toys for the Eid, as well as um, for those of you who want to pay your um, zakat al fitr. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll put a post out um, by Friday, Thursday, Friday, inshallah ta'ala, as we move into the last 10 nights of Ramadan. But alhamdulillah, we are accepting donations for uh, toys. Um, you guys know that every Eid, alhamdulillah, we come to the Eid and we have a, a gang of toys for um for the kids inshallah ta'ala after i come back from umrah inshallah ta'ala we will have classes for sisters we will begin a sisters class inshallah once we come back from umrah uh in may inshallah ta'ala all right something that i've been thinking about for a long time uh but we will have sisters classes sisters only classes inshallah ta'ala starting in may once i come back from umrah And I'll take some suggestions. If there are any suggestions, you can email me. Uh, you can DM me any suggestions you have for the sisters class, inshallah ta'ala. Any subject matters that you think it would be, um, um, you know, beneficial. All right. Jazakumullah khayran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Wa sallallahu ala nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira wa akhiru da'wana. Anilhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.